Soldiers of fortune, dogs of war. For some, they are knights in shining armor, coming to save the day when governments fail. For others, they are bloodhounds, thirsty for cash, ready to kill for the highest bidder. Where does the truth lie? Can mercenaries make the world safer, or are they just pawns in a game of power? So we have Simon Mann in the studio, ex-British military officer, also a former mercenary. Simon, it's really great to have you with us today. You were serving in elite royal troops. You were taking orders from the Queen. And how hard was it afterwards to sell your services to the higher bidder? Well, it wasn't really like that because, first of all, I was never senior enough for the Queen to actually tell me personally <laughs> what to do. Um, I was, uh, you know, I was a captain in the Scots Guards, and uh, the Scots Guards obviously has the privilege of guarding the Queen. And then when I became a mercenary, you know, we actually started, we got involved in this because we were attacked uh, in Angola, and so we, we sided with the government and fought back. So for me, that wasn't um, that hard a transition to make at all because I found myself actually in the Angolan army. I was, I was signed up in the <coughs> Angolan army. And in fact, I had the rank of brigadier general in the Angolan army. So a lot of things were, 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 were not so different. But how much, how much of it was about the money, though? Because pri private military company does imply selling your skills and services for money. And you weren't really doing it for, for pro bono. No, that's true. Um, but at, what I'm saying is that at the beginning, when we, you asked me how I started, how I became a mercenary, and, and that was how. Um, later, we, we established executive outcomes, and money became much more of an issue. And yes, it was primarily for, for, for money that we were operating. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm just trying to uh, imagine for myself, I mean, how hard is it to justify things you fight for when the war that you are fighting has nothing to do with your family, your men, your countrymen? Um, I, I didn't find it difficult. Uh, you know, I'd been a professional soldier in the British Army for 12 years, and um, we were asked to do things, expected to do things that were, were not necessarily how we saw the world and not necessarily what we wanted to do. So to then find myself um, protecting my old company in the first instance and then making money in Angola, which was a country I really liked, uh, was fine. And then to find myself in Sierra Leone fighting really ghastly rebels who were committing terrible atrocities was also fine. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I just wonder, why did you leave the British Army in the first place? I mean, you know, you guys are paid to to, to fight for good causes. I mean, British Army certainly positions itself uh, to be at the rescue of democracies in crisis. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I actually joined. In fact, I was asked to stay on in the British Army um, that time, and I was asked to do another job with my regiment, which was then the Special Air Service, or had been the Special Air Service. Um, and I was very tempted to do that job. But my friend, who was the owner or, and chief executive of Heritage Oil and Gas, said, come on, Simon, it's time you made some real money. You've got kids, et cetera, et cetera. Join my oil company. So my new career was as an oil man. It was accidental that we then became what we did become, which was you know, the number one private military company in Africa. So is the manufacturer the main difference between your work as a mercenary uh, and uh, between being an officer in British Special Forces? Uh, um, I would actually say no, um, because when you find yourself um, in wars purely for money or mainly for money, then um, there are a lot of things which become extremely difficult, um, which, which are issues, which are problems, which you do not have if you are um, in, a, in a normal you know, sovereign state military force. So what, what issues are those? Well, for example, um, you might find yourself having to make a decision as to whether we have three helicopters in an operational theater or two. Now, if it's three, that's the cost of that helicopter and operating it. 
coming straight out of your pocket if you're one of the owners of that company. Now you know you could probably get away with two, but the lack of that third is very likely to lead to, um, you know, quite probably the death of uh, one of your your soldiers. So what you what you end up having to do is make um, financial, business-like decisions with, with on the other end of the scale, instead of a normal sort of business decision where is it a good idea to invest this money or not, it's like people's lives. And that is hard, and that is not something you have to do in, in a regular army. Those decisions are basically being taken for you in a regular army, and you just have to make the most of, most of it and get on with your orders. Huh, so it's just easier to obey orders than to make your own decisions? Uh, well, making your own decisions when you're having to make that kind of decision is, is tough. Because obviously, you know, you, you're there, you're, make, you're making money, but you don't, so you, you, you're, you're playing a balance about are we going to be utterly ruthless with the lives of our men and boost the profit, or what? But Simon, did you actually, did you, did you actually fight uh, with the gun in your hand? Were you in the front lines, or was it just a logistical work? Um, I, I was shot at um, on a number of occasions. I was armed, um, but I never actually got into the position where I had to shoot back. I mean, I was a fairly sort of senior officer. I'm asking because Sierra Leone is known to have children soldiers uh, in the ranks of their rebels. I was wondering if you've ever come across kids with the guns. What is it like facing your enemy, but there are kids with the guns? Yeah, I mean, like um, in Sierra Leone, I never got that close to the fighting when there were um, child soldiers involved. Um, but these child soldiers um, were, I mean, they were very often on drugs and the, the atrocities that were being committed by them were, were dreadful. Oh yeah, absolutely, but I'm, I mean, I'm just assuming that like um, a European bred man, when he sees a child soldier, even if that child soldier is on drugs, probably has a moral dilemma whether to shoot at him or not. Yeah, I was never, I'm glad to say, in that position, but I guess some of the guys were. Um, what happened there? That did, must did, have been pretty tough for them. Did, did you guys ever talk about it? Did any of your um, colleagues tell you about this? No, no, because you know, very often the fighting is not sort of not not um, in direct sight of the enemy. It's a, a case of there's incoming fire and you're firing back. You can't even really tell whether they're children or whether they're adults. Um, the bullets are coming towards you either way. So, um, for those who are actually fighting on the front lines, they consider these child rebels to be a full-fledged soldiers and full-fledged enemy, right? Basically, yes. Mm -hmm. But do you know uh, how many civilians have suffered during your operations, if any? Well, I mean, there was dreadful suffering going on by a very large number of civilians, no question. And uh, our objective was to end those wars, both of them, as quickly as possible. But during um, that operation, th during the operation itself, mm -hmm. do you know how many civilians have um, suffered no, during mean, the operation? What, how many civilians we might have killed accidentally or something yeah. like that? Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yes. No, no. and in fact, one of, the, one of the things that Executive Outcomes is, is very proud of is that in both of those wars, in Angola and Sierra Leone, there was never one single um, charge made against us that there had been any kind of atrocity um, committed by us. Now that's actually a track record which I think most regular armies would be jealous of. Mm -hmm. but, so when you were talking to local people um, outside the operation, did they treat you as liberators or, or, or enemies? They treat us as, as liberators, absolutely. No, in fact, on one occasion, um, I was actually approached by the mayor of a town in Sierra Leone, a place called Koidu, by the mayor and his senior councillors, who had a bag of money that they gave me, or tried to give me, because they had heard that we were withdrawing from that, um, that particular place on the orders of the government. And it amazed me that here were these extremely tough uh, South African soldiers with a pretty ferocious uh, reputation, 
and here with these local people begging us to stay. <laughs> um, Simon, we're going to take a short break now and uh, right after we'll be back with the mercenary Simon Men to talk about African prisons and how toppling foreign governments help spread democracy around the world. So stay with us. We're back with Simon Mann, ex-British SAS officer and also a former mercenary. So Simon, did you ever witness anything you'd like to forget during your time in Africa? You know, I, I, I don't like seeing the results of fighting. Um, and I don't think uh, any soldier does. Um, it's always shocking. And um, it stays with you. And you wish it, it wasn't happening. But what was it exactly? Was it something particular to those operations or to Africa? Because, I mean, obviously no one likes to play the war. But was it something so dreadful about those operations in Africa that you would like to forget? Uh, yeah, there was, a, um, there was a village in um, Sierra Leone where, where we, got, we got there after the RUF, who was a guerrilla force, had pulled out. And um, there were bits of body all over the all over the village um, it wasn't it wasn't a pretty sight hmm. was it even worse than what you saw or experienced in the African prisons that you were put in for a short period of time yeah well as, as you know I was in prison for five and a half years in total four years in Zimbabwe and 18 months in Equatorial Guinea notorious prison and in Equatorial um, Guinea I mean that was very I mean, no one wants to be held in that yeah, prison. 18. No, that was called Black Beach. Although, actually, I think, I don't know, I was in solitary confinement in, in Black Beach all the time. Um, and so I didn't see a lot of the stuff that was going on outside my cell. But how did they Whereas treat you Zimbabwe, there? Whereas in Zimbabwe, I was in the... Um, well, in the end, they treated me well. I'd, I'd managed to help them. Um, and uh, I had a long interrogation and a long trial. And in the course of that, um, we, you know, we, we got along better and better as time went on. But it was, um, it was tough because I was um, in solitary confinement. And for the first uh, three months, I was in um, handcuffs and leg irons all the time. And uh, the climate there is pretty vicious. I mean, it's really, really hot and sticky with a lot of mosquitoes, no mosquito net, no ventilation, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it, was quite, um, it was quite testing. What about Zimbabwe prison? Well, that was a very different experience because there I was with uh, general prisoners, um, very overcrowded prison and, um, you know, a rough place. But how is it for a foreigner to be in an African prison with everyone else? Did they treat you better or worse because you were a foreigner? Well, African culture is extremely um, friendly, especially to foreigners. And their whole instinct is actually to look after you. And, uh, and I was looked after. Huh, so I get... I guess you got lucky there, at least. But you know what I'm thinking? I mean, surely you knew that the things you were doing, and I mean fighting a mercenary war, was illegal. Um, and you were most likely to end up in jail. Were you prepared for the consequences? I, I was, yes. Obviously, I had to be. I mean, I couldn't possibly have set out to do what we set out to try and do, which was to overthrow the government of Equatorial Guinea. Had I not been aware that if things went wrong, I would have been thrown into prison. I was very aware of it. Um, so far as I was concerned, it was just a part of the equation. It was a part of the risk that we were running. So the money was really good enough for that risk to be taken? Uh, well, I actually lost a whole lot of money, in fact. I mean, in reality, <laughs> um, I wasn't paid anything to do the Equatorial Guinea exercise. Um, <laughs> Had it all been successful, then I would have been paid a lot of money, but only after a long chain of um, ifs, you know, if we'd been successful, if the person we'd backed had ultimately been elected, 